All right, so hi everyone. I'm really excited to give this training session today. So as you've heard, my name is Catherine. So today I'm going to talk about issues relating to gender and feminism. I'm going to talk about things like the gender construct, how the gender construct shapes norms that are promoted in society, and how the aims of the feminist movement try to essentially deal with those things, right? So the reason I think these uh, these issues are quite important is because quite a few debates relate explicitly to feminism and gender, but also debates around things like relationships, things like a motion about sex education that I saw recently, for example, also um, relate to these issues. So although we won't be able to kind of talk about every single thing relating to gender and feminism, what I want to do is basically just highlight some important issues around these things that I think will be very useful when you have debates that are either explicitly about feminist issues or about gender issues, or just debates where these issues would be relevant. So I'm going to start by speaking about the gender construct. So this is essentially the idea that although sex is a biological thing, it's different to gender in the sense that gender roles aren't inherent to like the bodies that people are born with, rather they're a social construct. So that's basically the idea that gender roles are informed by how people have historically interacted with each other. So Judith Lauber, who's a sociology professor, states that although people tend to assume that gender is a trait that people are um, inherently given or are born with, it's actually, and I quote, constantly created and recreated out of human interaction, out of social life, and is the texture and order of that social life. So that's basically to say that as people have interacted with each other, they've formed ideas of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. And these ideas have kind of carried on to influence how people then have gone on to interact with each other. So Lauber goes on to explain that individuals are essentially given these gendered identities. So that's an identity as a man or identity as a woman when they're born and when their biological sex is determined because people have um, historically conflated biological sex with gender. And then these identities that people are given are then kind of further ingrained in them through how they're treated by others according to what people sort of perceive as their gender and what people perceive as gender norms. And these also include norms around sexual identity sexual activities, so like what people expect from relationships, as well as what people expect in terms of roles in parenting, as well as roles in the workplace. So that's essentially the, the idea that once people are born, they're sort of given all of these expectations around what people think it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. And this kind of affects things like the workplace, things like if they go on to become parents, how they interact within romantic relationships, and yeah, all of these other things. So these social norms basically cause people to kind of think that they should act in certain ways and should sort of occupy certain positions in society based on these gender identities. So according to Lauber, people use gender as basically a way of organizing society and assigning people to like different roles and different tasks they should do. And she claims that basically every society classifies people based on either male or female children or men and women who would be ready for marriage and then mature men and women. So basically society kind of has categories around gender and around people's age or stages in life, right? So these groups that people are categorized into influence their life experiences. And then this means that it shapes what they, um, what they aim to do, so their goals, as well as their feelings and their characteristics, right? So these groups basically include normative ideas of what each role should do and how each role should behave. So normative basically just refers to what people think someone should do. So I might use this term a lot, that's 
um, just some clarity of what it means. So Lorber is basically saying that once people are given their categories around their gender and their age, they're given all of these ideas around what society thinks they should do based on these gender roles, right? So these norms also include things like romantic relationships, how people should act within these relationships. And I think something that I want to note here is that they're also very heteronormative. So that includes the idea that as people are expected to act in certain ways, where, because um, like if they're men or if they're women, they're also expected to like have relationships that involve only men and women, right? So that's the idea that historically LGBTQIA plus relationships have sort of been dismissed or excluded by wider society because there's the expectation that men and women always have relationships with each other. And of course, that's not true. It also includes um, an issue that I want to highlight around these relationship norms that women are basically pressured to be desirable according to the male gaze, right? So to explain this, I want to quote the author Margaret Atwood, who wrote um, Handmaid's Tale, which was made into a TV show. So Atwood says, male fantasies, male fantasies. Is everything run by male fantasies? Up on a pedestal or down on your knees? It's all a male fantasy. That you're strong enough to take what they dish out, or else too weak to do anything about it. So what Atwood is essentially saying that there's an idea based on, or rather that first there's a pressure placed on women to be desirable to men, so to fulfill the male fantasy. And then connected to this, there are a bunch of different ideas of what the male fantasy is, and that these ideas, as shown in the quote, kind of encompass lots of qualities, but they're also quite unrealistic in terms of how women really think and feel. But at the same time, the pressure to fulfill male fantasies does influence how women um, might act, because they essentially are told from a young age that they sort of have to have to be appealing to men, right? So this kind of pressure to be desirable and these male fantasies are sort of things that come about to women from quite a young age, right? So for example, you might see magazines that are aimed at teenage girls that have like advice on like how to get boys to notice you. So that's an example of where women are essentially just taught that they're sort of there to fulfill the male gaze, right? And to sort of appeal to the male gaze. So now I want to speak a bit more about um, some of the problems in terms of how the gender construct affects how people sort of think about what it means to be male or what it means to be female, right? So one of the main problems is that womanhood and femininity are basically seen as things that are inferior, right? So as I mentioned before, because people are categorized based on the binary of men and women, that not only are they essentially put into different groups, but these groups um, these groups allow for unequal treatment according to, yeah, according to the grouping, right? So that's essentially the idea that within the patriarchal society, that is to say within a male dominated society where people who are considered male have more power, right? This then means that women are the group that is seen as inferior, right? So that's the idea that in general, there are a lot of society wide ideas that basically portray women as sort of less important. So this does include things like women historically not having the right to vote, women sort of not, um, for example, being allowed to be politicians and to occupy powerful positions. It also includes like um, the wall in the workplace and so they're okay less. But something I want to note here is that it doesn't just include these sort of grander political elements, it also includes things that we see in our everyday lives, right? So for example, a lot, there's a lot of prevalence of women who get interrupted when they have conversations with men. This is also something that happens in debating. For example, in panel discussions, female judges might get interrupted very often, 
or they might get lower judge scores by male speakers. And that's, that's an example of what we can describe as an implicit bias, right? So implicit biases are basically biases such as things like sexism or racism that are implicit in the sense that people might not always realize that they're doing something biased, but they actually are, right? So that's the idea that people sort of implicitly see women as, more, as less important, and so they interrupt women when they speak to them, or people implicitly think women's opinions are less clever or less well-informed, and, so, um, and so they interrupt them, or there's, an idea called mansplaining, which is basically the idea that like, if a woman tries to talk about a topic that she knows a lot about, a man will like come and think that he knows more about her and like dominate the conversation. So these are examples that we might see more in everyday life that kind of show the idea that women are essentially perceived as less important or um, inferior. And another issue around the unequal treatment of men and women is that the idea of femininity or rather things that are typically associated with femininity are seen as bad or associated with things like weakness, irrationality, hysteria, or just a lack of intellect, right? So um, some examples of this are like there's basically this idea that emotions and logic are two separate things and there's the and then connected to this is the idea that women are more associated with being emotional and so being emotional is seen as a bad thing because it's associated with women whereas on the other hand being logical is seen as something masculine and so it's seen as something that's better than being emotional right so that's the idea that something that's seen as associated with women is seen as something that's um that's bad or something that's like not to be taken seriously another example of this is where women who work in certain corporate environments might speak about how they have to dress in a less feminine way in order to be taken seriously right so for example some women feel that they have to like wear trousers in order to be taken seriously because if they go to work in a dress they, they might be like dismissed or um not treated as like a serious um a serious person in the workplace so these are examples just in everyday life where femininity is seen as a bad thing. And I want to also note that this is something that affects men in a negative way as well. So as I spoke about emotions a bit earlier, there's the idea that men in order to be masculine need to not show emotions. And in actual fact, it's actually quite harmful to like repress your emotions on a sort of psychological point of view, right? This also affects men who are a part of the LGBTQ community. So a lot of the times, men who identify as um as homosexual might be unfairly stereotyped as being more feminine or they might be sort of made fun of for appearing more feminine so that's the idea that like gay or homosexual men are sort of stereotyped in this way and, and the idea that these men act in a way that's feminine is seen as something that should be made fun of and dismissed and that then speaks to the idea that femininity is something that's um, that's bad or that's something that should be mocked, right? And another issue I want to then mention around gender norms is that these gender norms restrict people's autonomy or restrict people's choices, right? So autonomy is basically people's capacity to make their own decisions based on what makes them happy or what they consider valuable to live their lives, right? So this autonomy can be harmed by these gender norms because societal norms are sort of inherently pressurizing, right, or coercive. So basically people feel a pressure to act in a certain way, or they're coerced in a certain way through things like their families telling them to do something. So that's an example of this is like women's families might always like ask them when they're going to get married. So these women feel like they have to get married because of this gender norm that you as a woman's value is like being a wife and being a homemaker. And the problem with this is that this isn't always 
a reflection of what people actually want to do with their lives. So women sort of feel coerced into sort of raising children or um, getting married rather than like having jobs that they might actually want more than this, right? So it's the idea that what people want to do with their lives and what society tells people that's, that gives them value as a woman or as a man might be two different things. And that's where people's autonomy is affected, right? And I think why this is important is when these expectations are sort of so prevalent in society, it means that it can be really difficult or inaccessible for people to act in a way that's different, right? So if you sort of have this idea that you as a woman wouldn't be good as an employee in the workplace, then you might have a hard time finding a job, right? Because the people in power positions will be affected by this idea and they'll think that you're not going to be a good person to hire compared to um, compared to a man, right? So on the other hand, something I also want to note here is that the things that we might typically associate with being traditionally feminine aren't inherently bad, right? So for example, wearing makeup or wearing high heels aren't like inherently bad things, right? But what is bad is that women feel pressured to wear makeup in order to be acceptable. That women feel pressure to wear high heels in the workplace in order to like look professional. So it's that pressure that's the problem, not the thing itself, right? And the other thing that's a problem is the idea that your value as a woman is connected to these things that might not be things that you um, actually enjoy or actually value, right? So the idea that as a woman, your values in, say, being a mother, for example, even though there's nothing wrong with being a mother, of course, it's like obviously something that takes a lot of kind of personal sacrifice and effort. Well, that's obviously not a bad thing. The idea that that's your only way to be valuable as a woman is what's bad. And the idea that you might be pressured to take that path in life is what's bad. So here, the reason I mention this is because there might sometimes be debates around things that the feminist movement should promote or not promote, or like should oppose or not oppose. So there's a popular motion about like the feminist movement, um, like promoting wearing makeup or the feminist movement like advocating for women not to wear makeup so this issue basically says that if women feel pressure to wear makeup that's a bad thing but wearing makeup in itself isn't a bad thing so i think that this is something that's quite important to note when you sort of face motions like this and the reason i'm speaking a bit about autonomy and choice is because these things have a lot to do with people's preferences, people's values, and people's own idea of what makes a good life for them. I think that following these things in the sense that it leads to these people's individual happiness and sense of fulfillment, this means that it is a factor in the feminist aim because it's a factor in the idea of women's liberation and women's rights, but it also encompasses things like political and personal and social equality because for example something like voting affects your autonomy and so this shows how the things that the feminist movement fights for basically include like things that maximize women's autonomy and women's ability um, to be able to choose as much as possible like what gives them value as a woman and what gives them a good life. So another thing I want to speak about in terms of looking a bit more on feminism and feminist goals is kind of looking at the idea of what the aims of the feminist movement are can sometimes be slightly different based on context. And here I want to first speak about intersectionality and the idea of um, intersectional feminism. So I want to speak a bit about intersectionality in terms of Kimberly Crenshaw who's a pretty well-known critical race theorist who has also written quite a bit around intersectional feminism. Oh yeah, by the way, if you have any questions throughout, um, feel free to just post them in the chat. And um, yeah, I'm happy to kind of answer questions as we go along, but I can also like answer questions at the end. So yeah, going on to intersectionality. So Kimberly Crenshaw basically says, um, and I'm going to quote her, 
This illusion of difference in identity politics is problematic, fundamentally because the violence that many women experience is often shaped by other dimensions in their identities, such as race and class. So basically what she's saying here is that women's issues for some women are affected by other parts of their identity, right? So for example, a black woman and a white woman would have different struggles and so would need different things, particularly out of the feminist movement, right? So that's the idea that people's identities insofar as they have different factors and the oppression that comes from things like racism and then also sexism can be sort of intertwined. So that's why kind of feminism sort of ought to then take into account that people have different struggles according to different aspects of their identities and how these struggles can actually be connected. So um, to go on to what Crenshaw says is that if, as this analysis asserts, history and context determine the utility of identity politics, how then do we understand identity politics today, especially in light of our recognition of multiple dimensions of identity? So here she's highlighting how people have multiple parts of their identity. So things like race alongside things like gender, as well as things like their social class and how identity politics is useful insofar as these parts of people's identity are influenced by um, the context in which people live, right? She goes on to say more specifically, what does it mean to argue that gender identities have been obscured in anti-racist discourses, just as race identities have been obscured in feminist discourses? Does that mean we cannot talk about identity or instead that any discourse about identity has to acknowledge how our identities are constructed through the intersection of multiple dimensions? A beginning response to these questions requires we first recognize that the organized identity groups in which we find ourselves are in fact coalitions, or at least potential coalitions waiting to be formed. So here she highlights how fighting against racism has at times um, kind of not emphasized the issues that women or gender minorities face, as well as how feminism has at times neglected the issues that women who aren't white face, right? So what she says at the end is basically that people should sort of, within different groups around things like race and gender, should kind of connect these groups together and not see fighting for racial equality, not see fighting for gender equality as necessarily sort of two separate things, but rather allowing for social justice activism to kind of encompass for like linking these two aspects of people's identities together. So essentially things like the feminist movement advocating against racism, for example. So yeah, that's essentially the broad idea of what intersectional femi feminism is about and kind of what it um, aims to sort of accomplish. So she goes on to say through an awareness of intersectionality, we can better acknowledge and ground the differences among us and negotiate the means by which these differences will find expression in constructing group politics. So that's the idea that when people kind of acknowledge that there are different ways that oppression affects people based on the different identity groups that they might occupy, that then it becomes kind of easier or in a better position to then fight for these causes because people then have an understanding of how different groups of people within one broader group might sort of need different things, right? So that's the idea that within the broader group of the feminist movement, women of different races face different types of oppression to white women. And so the feminist movement ought to then take that into account within the kind of thing, the kinds of goals that the feminist movement has and the kinds of things the feminist movement um, advocates for. So it's essentially the idea that we sort of need to take into account differences even within a sort of larger social justice advocating group, right? And I think something in particular I want to highlight, um, because often in debates, 
there is sometimes a lack of clarity in kind of where debates are situated. And the reason I think this, this like stuff around intersectional feminism is relevant here is because the kinds of aims of the feminist movement can slightly differ based on the context of where a debate might be happening, right? So those for whom the feminist movement advocates for essentially might have different needs or different interests based on like where a discussion is taking place. All right, I see a question. Can intersectionality be used in debates about the lean in movement? Um, I definitely think, yeah, I definitely think it can be used around the lean in movement. Um, would someone mind just maybe clarifying for the sake of discussion what the lean in movement refers to? Maybe if you have like a more brief definition of it than I do. All right, so I'll give you a minute. But I think definitely there are ways that intersectionality should, or rather it can be discussed. Because um, a lot of times I've seen in debates where either there's an explicit context setting, like for example, in a particular country, or for example, in the developing world, where people tend to sort of miss how that context might relate to what the feminist movement's aims are. All right, Selena, so the idea that a woman, yeah, that a woman pushes herself, a woman who pushes herself to do her best will succeed. So I think this, in relation to intersectional feminism, can actually be a really interesting discussion. Oh yeah, so the idea of like, oh yeah, the idea of women focusing on the woman rather than changing the structures around here. This I think can be really interesting, right? So perhaps if it's a motion in favor of the lean-in movement, perhaps a way that opposition can then oppose the motion could be sort of around intersectionality, wherein, for example, a white woman might then advocate for like anti-racist, like anti-racism, which might take the focus away from themselves as individuals and rather for others in terms of a more intersectional agenda. So that could be a potential opposition line in a situation where the debate's sort of in favor of or where the motions around supporting the lean-in movement in terms of like intersectionality can I think be framed as something that's distinct from this. But I think it might also depend on like who the woman in question is, right? Because if the woman in question who would be going about, um, yeah, going about doing the lean in movement, that woman might also, like in doing so, that woman might also be kind of um, encompassing intersectional causes, right? So if the focus is on a woman who isn't white or a woman who isn't heterosexual, for example, then like intersectionality implicitly perhaps could be achieved um, by this woman, yeah, by this woman going about the lean-in movement. So I definitely think intersectionality is a good avenue in these debates. I think in feminist motions in general, it can a lot of times be particularly a good closing argument to focus on insofar as some debates in opening half might sort of focus more on feminism broadly and not go into the specific aspect of intersectional feminism. So yeah, it is something I would recommend as like either looking at a, an alternative to other like other aspects of feminism like the lean in, um, like lean in feminism. Um, and I, but I also think it's a good kind of extra way to like look into, um, to look into situations of the debates we're speaking about. So we're going to speak a little bit more about how women in different contexts might need different things in terms of women's rights advocacy. So I think here, for example, when we speak about women in the developed world, the kinds of issues that the feminist movement 
might be advocating for would be things like workplace environment, things like the pay gap, things like political representation. And this isn't to say that these issues aren't also important in the developing world. I just want to highlight that context does shape the more immediate needs as well as the sort of other more long-term needs of women in terms of women's rights advocacy. So the specific example that I want to speak about is the South African context. Um, obviously, I don't have like all encompassing knowledge of all countries where different women would want different things, but I do have some insight into a kind of um, how women's issues play out within the South African context. So that's why it's something that I want to speak about. Um, here, I want to give a quick content warning that I will make some mentions of gender-based violence. Um, I'm gonna, I'll obviously try to be as kind of non-explicit as possible, but if this is something um, that's quite sensitive, I do just want to yeah, give a content warning about that. And the reason I do want to highlight this is because I think it's not only relevant potentially if you have feminist debates focusing on the developing world, but I think it also includes debates where you might have some element around criminal justice or around like crimes wherein you could potentially talk about crimes against women, right? So in terms of the extent to which gender-based violence is an issue in South Africa. If you guys recall, there was a case in the UK where basically a woman was attacked and killed while she was walking home, right? And this sort of caused mass uproar and protests around like why women shouldn't be in such an unsafe position for essentially like literally just walking, like just walking home and how, these things are so like horrible as a way that the patriarchy manifests right but i want to highlight that these kinds of crimes are things that happen in south africa on a very very like prominent basis right so these kinds of things are incredibly common here in terms of statistics i think in around 2019 there are about 53,293 sexual offenses that were reported, which means that on average, there would have been about 146 of these crimes per day. And there were about 52,420 in the previous year, right? And most of these crimes would have been sexual assault. And then of this, the police recorded about 42,289, sexual assaults in around 2019 to 2020, which would be an average of 116 sexual assaults each day. So the reason I bring up these statistics is just to kind of illustrate the extent to which this type of violence against women is prevalent within South African society. It's also something that people spoke about quite a bit once, once we went into lockdown last year. So because a large issue in terms of crimes against women include domestic violence, which includes partner violence, once lockdown happened, which would have meant like people were essentially forced to stay home potentially with abusive partners, this then caused some increases in the levels of domestic violence, as well as kind of some discourse around lockdown regulations and kind of how people could navigate maintaining lockdown regulations while potentially preventing domestic violence. An example of this is where alcohol sales got banned during periods of lockdown. So I think this is something that again, because there have been some debates around like different types of lockdown regulations that happened last year. I imagine they might decline, but they might keep happening. So I think that like where things like violence against women are relevant, I think these are like nuances that could potentially be brought up in terms of debates around lockdown regulations. But going back to um, what I was saying about uh, the rights of crimes against 
women, essentially according to statistics in South Africa, we can estimate that a woman is murdered about every three hours. So this phenomenon um, around women being murdered is what I'll refer to as femicide, in case you're unfamiliar with the term. It is something that happens in other countries, but based on the World Health Organization, it's five times higher in South Africa than the global average, um, which also has the fourth highest female interpersonal violence death rate out of around 183 countries. So that is to say that there are large amounts of instances in which women are, um, are essentially murdered. And the kind of ways in which this takes place are either sort of random, well not random, but crimes in which the victims and perpetrators don't know each other, but they also include a high number of um, high number of cases of partner violence, right? And the other kinds of crimes happen, they can happen in conjunction with things like robberies or home invasions, but they can also happen independently of these other crimes, right? So I think in debates where people talk about, where people talk about crimes in general, I think that crimes against women are often missed or under discussed, right? There's often an overfocus on like purely sort of economic crimes, right? Which obviously isn't the case. And I think the reason I want to speak about this in relation to the aims of the feminist movement and in relation um, to the gender construct is because as I've said, the gender construct basically means that those who are classified or categorized as men are considered more important a really harmful way that this patriarchal society manifests is that because women are seen as inferior and women are seen as less important, women are essentially given less power within society. And this is linked to this is linked to gender-based violence in the sense that the power dynamic manifests in men often having this perception that women are things that they can own or that women owe them something, be it owing them attention or owing them a romantic relationship. And this means that men then take this mindset and essentially use it to sort of carry out this violence as an expression of this idea that because I'm a man and you're a woman, I should like have the right to own you. I should have the right to sort of have your attention. And if you don't give me this attention, if you don't like carry out this relationship in the way that I want, then I have the right to punish you. So essentially that is to say that the power dynamic that's influenced by gender roles and the gender construct plays out in terms of men exercise, I mean, Okay, I want to flag now that I'm not trying to say that all men or even a majority of men do this. I'm more like just trying to link the cases where this happens with the gender construct. So if I say like, if I say men, I'm not referring to like every single man. I'm just referring to like the link between the construct and um, the effects. So that's to say that the construct, because it manifests in this power dynamic, this power dynamic then manifests in men expressing their power in ways that are particularly violent against women and controlling against women. So it's the idea that men will potentially murder or attack women as a way to control them or as a way to exercise control over them. For example, like if where like domestic violence happens, a lot of the cases that are reported involve like a woman being attacked or killed by her partner or her ex-partner because she tried to leave the relationship. So that's the idea that like, because I am a man, I should control you. If you're going to try and like leave from my control, I'm going to like not allow that by, you know, by attacking you. Um, all right, so I'm going to look at the chat because I see a question. One of the major criticisms is that women and men are inherently different. 
And even if you want to maximize equal opportunity, you get different outcomes. That one multi-fold study that is referenced a lot. Is this necessarily true? And how does this impact people who don't subscribe to the traditional gender binary? Okay, that's a really good question, actually. Um, the idea that men and women are inherently different. So this, yeah, there are, there have kind of been studies that assert that men and women are inherently different. I, I'll admit I'm not entirely familiar with all like the research on this, but I will say that I genuinely don't, I can't definitively say if men and women are inherently different. I think where the feminist movement kind of comes up is the idea, at least in my mind, that even if men and women have some inherent differences, that they shouldn't be sort of treated better or worse because of these differences, if that makes sense, right? And in terms of equal opportunity and different outcomes, I think, yeah, perhaps there might be kind of less desired outcomes in terms of how the differences play out. So for example, like, um, like going through pregnancy is at times like, I don't know, it can be very like painful, like physically draining, for example. And so that's where like maternity leave is important. So perhaps like if we were to say, oh, if men and women are equal, then uh, like maternity leave shouldn't be a thing that might like not kind of um, not allow for like the actual physical like toll that pregnancy takes on women. So yeah. That's one example I can think of where like the idea of trying to maximize equality might not actually play out in the outcomes we want. But I think kind of the way that the feminist movement can sort of account for that is perhaps maybe not looking at, always, maybe not always framing the aims in terms of equality per se, but rather in terms of allowing for um both like the aims that men and women have and like their autonomy to be respected but also like accounting for the potential like needs that come up for different individuals if that makes sense and then to talk about oh yeah for people who don't subscribe to the gender binary i think this is also something that's fairly important but also often, at least up until recently, not talked about as much in terms of feminist theory, because in my mind, like um, non-binary people as being understood is a somewhat modern phenomenon. And so, yeah, I agree. Feminist theory often like doesn't really sort of encompass non-binary people, which is of course a problem. And so I think, this is somewhat difficult to answer, but I think when it comes to people who might not identify as either male or female, I think what the feminist movement should aim to do is sort of allow for them to live in a way that doesn't force them to kind of, um, to kind of conform to one part of the gender binary where they otherwise wouldn't. I'm perhaps, un, I'm a bit unsure of like how I would say that this manifests in real life, but I think that's kind of where the feminist movement should, um, yeah, should like start to include non-binary people. I hope I've answered this question. Um, yeah, feel free to ask like a follow-up. I hope I'm making sense here. So going back to speaking a bit more about the specific context around crimes against women in South Africa, another broader issue that I want to highlight, which could of course impact debates around, um, around kind of crime or criminal justice issues, as well as debates around media coverage. I think that another issue um, that I want to flag here 
is that often the way gender-based violence is reported or spoken about by the media has tendencies to sort of unfairly stereotype people of color as well as poor people, right? So often the media will characterize poorer areas as sort of inherently violent and like full of unemployment and things like alcoholism, but kind of not instead link these crimes to the social issues of misogyny and sexism, but rather like blame these issues on poverty, which is of course unfair and inaccurate given that like, um, based on some of the stuff I've said before, that these crimes are sort of more rooted in patriarchal ideas and rooted in sexist ideas. And an issue in media coverage is that this element of misogyny is often missed, right? There's also ideas on kind of um, which victims are sort of more worthy of support or attention than others. So a lot of times when you see crimes against women being reported on, women who are heterosexual, able-bodied, middle-class, or attractive white women are often seen as like the metaphor of purity and innocence, whereas where women who don't like fit into this kind of mold of what the ideal woman is, these women are more often sort of blamed for the things that happen against them, right? So for example, if there's a case where women might have consumed alcohol, that the media might then like use this to portray the woman who's the victim as almost deserving or um, almost like to blame for what happens to them. And this is an issue in general when it comes to violence against women is that given patriarchal norms that both encom that encompass or not taking women seriously, this often then means not taking violence against women seriously, right? So often it's either seen as like not a big deal. So for example, during the Me Too movement, a lot of the things that women who came forward spoke about were at times dismissed as like, oh, that happens to everyone or like, oh, it's just something that happens when people go out and get drunk and it's not a serious thing. So these crimes that are actually quite serious are often dismissed because there are things that happen. I'm not saying that they only happen to women, but more like the sort of rise of the Me Too movement um, did like include lots of women coming forward, right? So because these crimes are sort of associated with women in this way that they're seen as unimportant, but another way that the patriarchy influences this is that women are often seen as sort of blamed for the things that happen to them. For example, women might be asked like, oh, what were you wearing? Were you drinking? Like, you could have said no, for example, or something that might be said. That's the idea of like placing responsibility on the victim rather than on the perpetrator, as well as the idea of even not believing women, right? So a lot of times there have been reports of um, like women who try to come forward about things that happened to them, but are either sort of not believed or um, perpetrators might not get prosecuted or might be found innocent because people don't like, because people sort of think that women might be inherently lying. And connected to this is the idea that women like have perverse agendas when they accuse men of crimes, like they might, like there's the like idea that, oh, this woman's only accusing him of this because she wants to ruin his life. So that's again, going to the sexist or patriarchal idea that like women are inherently kind of deceptive or um, like trying to gain something rather than a victim who sort of deserves, um, who deserves justice, right? So the reason I kind of, I kind of want to speak a bit about these particular issues is not just to show how um, how an example of a certain country where crimes against women are so prevalent, this kind of illustrates how feminism has certain aims that might mean that some goals of the movement take sort of um, precedence based on the context of um, yeah, based on the context. So this means that where you have debates where you might be given a particular context or where you're sort of 
um, able to promote a certain context, this means that it's quite important to kind of, to think about what women in this context you're speaking about are going through, what kind of issues they're mostly facing, and then to link that to what the feminist movement ought to do or ought to prioritize. So this might include examples that are set in the developing world. An example of a motion like this is, um, there was one at a South African tournament about like vigilante justice for crimes against women in South Africa. So that's an example where you would like specifically have to look at the context of what South African women go through and why might vigilante justice be something that solves issues within this, this context, right? Other types of context could mean that aims around things like the pay gap or things like being equally respected in the workplace workplace could be like more immediate concerns of the feminist movement. So that's just illustrating the idea that context and aims are linked to each other. And so it's important to kind of have a clear context so that you can have a clear idea of what aims of the feminist movement ought to be. I also just generally want to highlight like issues around how the patriarchy can essentially play into crimes against women, which I think is in general helpful to an understanding of like serious problems with patriarchal societal norms in terms of things like men feeling like they have a right to control women or feeling like they're entitled to women's attention and how like this plays into very serious, um, very serious issues, as well as just some issues in general around crimes where you might be able to work this into debates around crimes in terms of how like this affects women's lives. So I think something that's sometimes missed where people do talk about crimes against women is how it actually affects women's everyday lives, whether or not women are like direct victims of these crimes. So for example, because violence against women is common where I live, it means that it's very like, it's very uncommon for women to be able to leave their homes alone. And it's very uncommon for women to be able to leave their homes at night. So this is a further example of how patriarchal societies affect women's autonomy, right? So because violence against women is common, it means that I as a woman like can't leave. Just to then further show how violence against women affects women's autonomy in an everyday sense, right? It also includes things like, like women where I live wouldn't take public transport alone. Like that's something that's unheard of. This has a bunch of knock-on effects, right? So I essentially have to drive a car or like buy a car because as a woman taking a train or a bus would be really unsafe for me. Like that's that's just a further example of where like these kinds of issues don't just include the actual crimes committed, but they create a society where women's everyday lives are impacted in a way that limits their like their choices because women have to kind of um, like pay attention to their own safety if they like want to yeah if they want to care about their own safety. So I think this hopefully illustrates not just ways in which not just important ideas around crimes against women if we're going to have debates that might include issues around crime and, and um, issues around reporting crime and how like at times the root causes aren't acknowledged but also just furthering how women's autonomy um, is affected by patriarchal society that goes back to the construct of gender and kind of goes back to how this contract construct shapes how people think men and women. Hey, um, yeah, all the content I want to go through. Are there any other questions? Um, can I stop the recording? Um, sure, if there's no other questions, I think that's fine. Yeah, thank you.